pushback because I had to go take care of some things, but I'm gonna give a chance to read it now. So for the recording, oh, what's up, Beck? For the recording, you're gonna hear some quiet because I'm gonna put some resources in the comment section, some mutual aids in the comment section, and as well as the PDF and the previous spaces. So give me a couple minutes to put the resource in and then I'll start reading. Hope you are doing good too. Let's see. Also, if y'all have some mutual aids to share, don't hesitate. Oh yeah, but for real. Yeah, let me make you um let me get you a mic real quick. Give me a minute. I just sent you a mic. Thanks for offering to help read. I really appreciate that. It's taking me a minute because I'm just adding like the um, spaces and the PDF to the Trample channel so people can have it. So it'll just take me a couple minutes. Also, if you have any mutual aids that you want to share, uh, feel free to put them in the Trample channel as well in the comment section. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have part two in the jumbo chant of the previous reading, and and the PDF is also in there. And I have a few more mutual aids that I want to share, so give me a minute. Okay. So again, the PDF is in the Jumbotron. Part two of the reading is in there as well. And if you have any mutual aids that you want to share to help get boosted, put them in the comment section so people can see them. And Beck, do you have the PDF open to... I'm on chapter four. What page is that? That's going to be... It shows 40, 45 or 47. Okay, one second. Here, on the protracted war. Yeah, exactly. So we, what we can do is every two pages, we'll switch off. How does that sound? It sounds great. Y'all, do I have any, like, background, too much background noise? I have my heater on. No, actually, it's perfect. I don't hear it anything okay. your voice is very clear let me just grab water real quick Beck, do you have water no i guess i said i'll i'll get some when you start reading cool um, so i'll go ahead and start protracted war uh popular forces versus regular armies the guerrilla as missionary mao zedong on the war of the fleet and the lessons of china Revolutionary wars are generally of necessity, wars of long duration. The seeds of revolution are slow to germinate. The roots and tendrils spread out silently underground long before there is any sign of sprout or bud. Then suddenly, one day, like new wheat springing up in a cultivated field, there is a blaze of color and overnight growth. The rebels are there and everywhere. It is customary to speak of guerrilla wars as wars of attrition. The phrase is not perfectly accurate. Guerrilla warfare is not so much abrasive as subversive. It is a growth that penetrates the crevices of a rotting structure and one day bursts it asunder. Yet attrition does, after all, play a great part in the political sphere. The government is subjected to a constant wearing pressure that comes from the great expansive and anxiety of the anti-guerrilla campaign and from the constant cry of the opposition the banks, the business community, when will it all end? What are you going to do about it? Economic attrition has already been discussed. Sabotage is one aspect of it. The loss of credit and investment suffered by a country engaged in civil war is the other. 
far more important aspect. No small nation and a few great ones can stand the deprivation indefinitely. Yet the painful fact is that the guerrillas, for their part, can carry on indefinitely. Having no vested interests, no political opposition within their own ranks, no economic problems other than those that can be solved by extending the war and capturing what they need. The insurgents have nothing to lose and everything to gain by continuing the struggle. And on the other hand, they have nothing to gain and everything to lose by giving up. In fact, once the banner of rebellion has been raised and blood has been shed, it is no easy matter to give up. The rebels begin to fight for whatever reason they continue because they must. The fight, then, in order to survive, given their inferiority of the resources, can, they can re subverse, I'm sorry, survive only by avoiding direct confrontation with a superior enemy, that is, battle on the enemy's terms. Guerrilla strategy is dictated from the start by this consideration. The result, if the guerrilla are to be successful and to avoid extermination, is a protracted war. The conflict must continue until the movement has recruited and trained enough men and until the movement has recruit uh, and come into possession of enough arms to build a revolutionary army capable of defeating the regular army in open battle. Failing this, it must continue until political developments resulting from the campaign have brought about the desired end, the rising of the masses of the people and the overthrow or abdication of a discredited government. In Cuba, the Batista regime collapsed before the military confrontation had fully developed. The army, lacking leadership, its general staff gone, found no reason to continue the struggle and surrendered. A general strike in Havana, in other words, a rising of the people, was sufficient to make it clear to the military that there would be no further purpose in fighting. Batista had fled, and his designated heirs could not be forced on the rebellious country. Nothing but a revolutionary government would be accepted. Cuba is a prototype. It is typical of the dependent semi-colonial countries in which revolution can be attained without the bloody necessity of full-scale war. In such countries, it would be sufficient, barring intervention by the dominating colonial power, to create... All right, I read that wrong, sorry. To oh, no. To create by guerrilla warfare the conditions in which a discredited government discredited because it can no longer keep order and assure profit to country's proprietors, falls from lack of support, and the revolutionaries rush in to fill the political vacuum. All of the Central American dependencies of the United States and most of the South American republics, economic and political satellites of the United States, are in the same category as Cuba. Their governments can see the handwriting on the Cuban wall, so can Washington. Hence, the almost hysterical efforts since 1959 to isolate Cuba to keep the infection from spreading. If it does spread, and there is evidence that this has already happened to some extent, they may be expected to go to the way of Cuba. However, to say so is to assume that the United States will not intervene militarily. Intervention will create an entirely new picture. One could expect to see Indochina recreated in Latin America, and revolutionary shortcuts a la Cuba would be out. The remaining colonies of the European powers are in another category. Here, too, a political solution can obviate the, and I'm pretty sure I said that wrong, the necessity of a military showdown. It's really interesting to read this now and then also to, to look at current uprisings that are happening and resistance movements that are going on in the global south with a, a new lens. So we'll talk about this more. Um, Beck, you ready to take over? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yet in the case of the actual colonies, it will not be a matter of discrediting, discrediting the colonial power or its government, but simply of taking the profit and prestige out of colonialism. Cyprus provides a good example of an insurgency that was successful simply because terror, sabotage, and constant disorder made the island too unprofitable and politically embarrassing for the British to remain. They got out finally not because they were forced out but because there was there was no longer any compelling reason to remain parentheses and there were many good reasons for withdrawing in a third category are those revolutionary wars that must be won at last on the battlefield china is the classic example 
the laboratory in which principles were evolved that are still being proven today in all the backward areas of the world. Popular revolutionary forces can defeat regular armies. This is the fundamental lesson of China. Popular forces, to put the matter more precisely, can become armies, making the transition from guerrilla activity to mobile warfare that will be superior on their own ground to regular troops equipped with all of the heavy weapons produced by modern industry. How can a nation that is not industrialized defeat one that is? This says former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State E.L. Katzenbach Jr. is the problem that confronted Mao Taesong Taitong. The answer, which applies to insurgency anywhere as against the mechanized army, is guerrilla warfare. As Katzenbach, excuse me if I'm butchering the name, sees it, Mao's approach to the theory of war as applied to his own peculiar situation, that of China, was simply to shift the emphasis customarily given to the fundamental components of previous military doctrine where the industrial nations stress such tangible military factors as arms, logistics, and manpower, says Katzenbach, Mao looked to the intangibles, time, space, and will. Lacking the arms with which to confront well-equipped armies in the field, Mao avoided battle by surrendering, surrendering territory. And in doing so, Katzenbach writes, he traded space for time and used the time to produce will. The psychological capacity of the Chinese people to resist defeat. This is the essence of guerrilla warfare. Although Mao never stated it quite this way, writes Katzenbach, the, the basic premise of this theory is that political mobilization may be substituted for industrial mobilization with a successful military, with a successful military outcome. That is to say, his fundamental belief is that only those who will admit defeat can be defeated. So if the totality of a population can, can be made to resist surrender, this resistance can be turned into a war of attrition, which will eventually be inevitably, which will eventually and inevitably be victorious. The context brings to mind the well-known quotation from Mao, with the common people quote unquote, with the common people of the whole country mobilized, we shall create a vast sea of humanity and drown the enemy in it. As for the time factor, Katzenbach observes, Mao holds that military salvation stems from political con conver conversion. But no, conversion takes time. So Mao's military problem was how to organize space so that it could be made to yield time. His political problem was how to organize time so that it could be made to yield will. That quality which makes willingness to sacrifice the order of the day, the ability to bear, the ability to bear suffering cheerfully, the highest virtue. So Mao's real military problem was not that of getting the war over with, the question to which Western military thinkers have directed the greater part of their attention, but that of keeping it going. Mao's problem then, how to avoid a military decision. His answer, hit and run, fight and live to fight another day, give away before the determined advance of the enemy, and like the sea, close in again as the enemy passes. The formula space for time is well conceived, but in this selected military writings, Mao makes it clear that nothing is gained unless time is used to produce political results by raising the revolutionary consciousness, the will of the masses. When the Red Army fights, it fights not merely for the sake of fighting, but to agitate the masses, to organize them, and to help them establish revolutionary political power. Apart from sub such sub a <laughs> Apart from such objectives, fighting loses its meaning and the Red Army the reason for its existence. Mao believes that revolutionary war itself is the university in which guerrilla fighters are schooled and that war develops its own lessons and principles. Our chief method is to learn warfare through warfare. A person who has had no opportunity to go to school can learn warfare. He can learn through fighting in war. A revolutionary war is a mass undertaking. It is often not a matter of first learning and then doing, 
but of doing and then learning, for doing itself is learning. There is a gap between the ordinary civilian and the soldier, but it is no great wall, and it can be quickly closed. And the way to close it is to take part in revolution and war. Mm. Yeah, good job. Real quick, before I continue reading, um, I want to just remind people that there is an option to turn on captions to help. Um, it helps people sometimes if they're looking at the screen to really understand and to get a, a reading going on. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> Captions are helpful, <laughs> is basically what I'm trying to say. And then there's something else on my mind I wanted to remember, and I literally forgot. Oh, as you're reading, you're going to hear this cracker use terms like backwards when describing uh, nations in the global south and resistance movements in the so global south. Yes, it's racism. Yes, a red flag should fly up when you hear that. And we'll talk about that, too, in the discussion. So I just want to encourage people that even though a lot of this shit will, you know, hits, to still be discerning when you're listening to these reading spaces. And, you know, when you hear something that's like, oh, that don't sound right, make a note so we can talk about it too, because I guarantee you're not the only one who caught it or feels that way. So when the discussion comes, we can talk about it more and expand upon it. Um, oh yeah, Four of Cups, I see you grabbed the mic. Did you also want to read? I sure did. Oh, good. Do you, you want to take this next page? And I'll go after you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, political mobilization, rising, raising the level of political consciousness of the people and involving them actively in the revolutionary struggle is the first task of the guerrillas. And it, and it is the nature of this effort, which necessarily takes time, that accounts for the protracted character of revolutionary war. The study of Mao, however, discloses something more. Time is required, not alone for political mobilization, but to allow the inherent weaknesses of the enemy to, de to develop under the stress of war. Mao makes this point more than once in his military writings in several different contexts. In the Sino-Japanese War, for example, Japan and industrial power had the great advantage of a superior war machine capable of striking devastating blows at the poorly armed troops of semi-feudal, semi-colonial, un unindustrial China. Yet such an advantage, unless immediately decisive, could not compensate for decade for def for defects that would become apparent in prolonged conflict. The first of these was that Japan, while powerful militarily, lacks the base in natural resources and manpower to sustain her war machine far from home and in, va in a vast populous country over a long period of time. Indeed, the war had been started to compensate for the defect, but extended through conquest Japan's paucity of material resources. Insofar as this was true, war was an act of desperation and a contradiction, putting the cart before the horse for what would happen if the war was not won quickly and the new wealth quickly absorbed and exploited. Japan was seeking of necess Japan was seeking of necessity a war of quick decision. The correct military response was to deny it by avoiding a military conf confrontation and fighting along the lines of guerrilla and mobile warfare, trading the vast space of China for the time necessary to let the inherent weaknesses of Ch Japan develop and, to, and show themselves under the stress of protracted war to to build Chinese resistance forces to to the strength and degree of organization needed to confront the gradually weakened Japanese war machine. As Mao analyzed the situation, Japan's war is conducted on the basis of her great military, economic, and political organizational power. But at the same time, it rests on an inadequate 
natural endowment, Japan's military, economic, and political organizational power is great, but quantitatively, quantitative something, quantitatively um, inadequate. Japan is a comparatively small country, deficient in manpower and in military, financial, and material resources, and she cannot stand a prolonged war. Japan's rulers are endeavoring to resolve this difficulty through war, but again, they will get the very reverse of what they desire. That is to say, the war that they have launched to resolve this difficulty will end in adding to it and even in exhausting Japan's original resources. Other defects were apparent. The internal and external contradictions of Japanese imperialism have driven it not only to embark on an adventurous war unparalleled in scale, but also to approach its final course. In the terms of development, Japan is no longer a thriving country. The war will not lead to the prosperity sought by her ruling class, but to the very reverse, the doom of Japanese imperialism. This is what we mean by the retrogressive nature of Japan's war. It is, the react it is this reactionary quality coupled with the military feudal character of Japan's imperialism that gives rise to the peculiar barbarity of Japan's war, all of which will arouse to the utmost the class antagonisms within Japan, the antagonism between the Japanese and the Chinese nations, and the antagonism between Japan and most other countries of the world. While Japan can get international support from the fascist countries, the inter international opposition she is bound to enter, to encounter will be greater than her international support. This opposition will gradually grow and eventually will not only cancel out support, but even bear down on Japan itself. To sum up, Japan's advantage lies in it in her great capacity to wage war and her disadvantages lie in the reactionary and barbarous nature of her war in the inadequacy of her manpower and material resources and in her meager in her meager international support against the Japanese war making capacity with were pitted the Chinese advantages of space, time, and will. The long struggle for national liberation, as Mao notes, had tempered the Chinese people. Social and political gains had created a will that was capable of great sacrifice and resistance over long periods of time. And again, by contrast with China, with Jap Japan, China is a very big country with vast territory, rich resources, a large population, and plenty of soldiers and is capable of sustaining a long war. Space in which to maneuver abundant manpower, strong international support, and the Chinese will will to resist aggression. These were Chinese Chi this, these were China's advantages. They were also the reasons for avoiding a quick decision in favor of a protracted war, one in which Japan's single advantage, superior arms, and organization would be worn away. It can be seen that Japan has great military, economic, and political organizational power, but that her war is reactionary and barbarous, barbar barbarous, and her manpower and ma material resources are inadequate, and she is in in an unfavorable position internationally. China, on the other, China, on the contrary, has less military, economic, and political organizational power 
but she is in her era of progress. Her war is progressive and just. She is moreover a big country, a fact which enables her to sustain a protracted war. And she will be supported by most countries. Yo, thank you for real. Mm-hmm. You did a really good job. Thank you. So I hope both I hope both of y'all have water too, because I know when I'll be reading, my mouth be getting dry. So while I read, I hope y'all go get some water. And let's see. So basically, like what what Beck and Four of Cups read over, he's given like examples on what we read in the previous chapter three when he named you need the will, the conditions, and also the resources to align just right in the way of creating and sustaining a revolutionary process, aka a revolutionary war through guerrilla warfare. So I'll continue reading. The above are the basics, mutually contradictory characteristics of the Sino-Japanese War. They have determined and are determining the protracted character of the war and the fact that the final victory will go to China and not to Japan. The war is a, cont- is a contest between these characteristics. They will change in the course of the war, each according to its own nature, and from this, everything else will follow. Similar considerations determine the protracted character of the struggle against the warlords and later the, I am going to butcher this one, so I'm going to spell it out. It's K-U-O-M-I-N-T-A-N-G. If someone can like DM me how to say that right, or you can leave it in the comments. It would be really helpful. Um, During China's long civil war, in analyzing the Chinese situation, Mao notes the contradictions and conflicts of interest that arise on several planes. For example, between the various imperialist powers seeking dominance in China within the Chinese ruling classes, and between the ruling classes on the one hand and the broad masses of the people on the other. Conflict among the warlords and against the nationalist government creates a heavier burden of taxation. Two, heavier taxation causes the landlord class to exact exact more exorbitant rents from the peasants and increases the hatred of the latter for the landlords. Three, the backward condition of Chinese industry as related to foreign industry and foreign concessions in China causes a more vicious exploitation of Chinese labor and drives the wedge deeper between the workers and the Chinese bourgeoisie. And this cracker calling people backwards is not sitting right with me. I just want to make a note, but we'll talk about that too. Because of the pressure of foreign goods, the exhaustion of the purchasing power of the workers and the peasant masses, and the increase in government taxation, more and more dealers in Chinese-made goods and independent producers are being driven to bankruptcy. Because the reactionary government, though short of provisions and funds, endlessly expands its armies and thus constantly expands the warfare, the masses of the soldiers are in a constant state of privatization or privatization. Because of the, gov- because of the growth in government taxation, the rise in rent and interest demanded by the landlord, and the spread of the disastrous of war, there are famine and banditry elsewhere or everywhere, and the peasant masses and the urban poor can hardly keep alive. Because the schools have no money, many students fear that education may be interrupted because production is backward and many graduates have no hope of employment. So basically what he describes in those four points that he made is he talked about the, among, the conf, among the warlords and against the nationalist government creates a heavier burden of taxation. So as this is going on, a sabotage is happening to make up for loss of profits, they begin taxing the middle class more and more and more. And we see, and I'm drawing parallels so currently today. So how I'm going to explain this is say, okay, here's where I see commonalities as I read this. When he talks about heavier taxation, I, I look at now and how, how heavily taxed not just the middle classes, but also the lower class, the poorer you are, the more expensive it is, believe me. So I'm also including that in my analysis, right? So those conditions are here. And then they say having your taxation causes landlord to extract more from their rents. Now, a lot of people have gotten tax rates who are of the landlording class. So I'm going to say as they raise rents out of greed, and out of wanting more and more money to be extracted from the poor so they can cover their cost of living going up, that conditions are here. More people are priced out of apartments every single, every single day, 
like, and not only just the rent, we got to remember not to just look at that, look at also what it costs to get an apartment. So when you first fill out the application, there's an application fee. And then you have uh, not just application fee, but a lot of apartments now are causing for first month rent and security deposit just to move in. So you're talking about having access to thousands and thousands of dollars before you can even live in the apartment, much less get the admin up. fee. Oh, the admin fee, that too. Fees on top of fees. And not only that, the fees that accrue, like once you move out, like people just think like you move out and that's it. No, a lot of apartments do charge for cleaning fees. They're like, oh no, the carpet needs to get clean. So we're going to charge you for that. And that usually is thousands of dollars as well. The way in which they prey upon the poor is we do need to talk about it more in detail. And a lot of statistics and charts they put out are not going to account for these things, but just drawing parallels on the point. So that's point two, right? So then point three, the backward condition of Chinese industry and, uh, as related to foreign industry and foreign concessions in China causing more vicious exploitation of Chinese labor. So I'm going to relate that in current times, and I'm speaking of America, and I'll broaden the analysis too, is that the if we look at the current labor force, right, and again, a lot of us being pushed out, but what are the figures that they they keep spewing at us? Like, oh, under Biden, jobs doubled or whatever the fuck-ass uh, percentage that they put out, and yet when we look at the details and those living the actual experience will tell you, you know, I had to get two jobs because I can't afford my mortgage anymore and the jobs aren't paying enough. And then also too, they're no longer, a lot of jobs are switching to like contractors. So making people sign like 1099 so that, you know, your contract ends and every six months or every three months, you constantly have to put on performance to beg this fucking overseer to hire you again. And yet they double your workload every they time. To get you any benefits, no insurance, no nothing when you're a contracted worker. Each on it, exactly. So these conditions we're describing are already here. So that's why I'm, I, when I'm going, I'm going back to these bullet points we just read because I don't want us to just read and then just go on to the next page. I actually absorb how these conditions for revolutionary and guerrilla warfare are actually what we're currently in today. So, oh, I'm sorry, y'all want to add on anything? I know I was just piling on. Anything y'all want to say to speakers? Before I continue, who I'll keep reading. Uh, let me get back to the PDF. And just to reiterate, both of y'all did an amazing job because as y'all were reading, all these thoughts were going through my head. Oh, there's one more point. Uh, is the point four says, because of the pressure of foreign goods, the exhaustion of purchasing power of the workers and the peasant masses, basically everything being too goddamn high. <laughs> like the fuck, like people are sitting up here giving uh, each other tri uh, tips on how to save money it was like well if you just shop better and here's the reality there is nowhere you're going to be able to go to be able to afford food on the meager wages that they are giving this is just the reality as shit becomes more and more expensive as the jobs become more and more difficult to work because i know on the job not only you get hired for one thing and they try to double up your workload because what they're trying to do is maximize their profits so that they can get one person to do the job of five people and pay them even less than what they pay one person. Well, then that's more money in the capitalist pockets. The managerial class and the overseer class job is to make sure to maintain that oppressive system. And so that's, okay. I'm sorry. Can I add to that? It's not even just like getting one person to do the job of five people. In a lot of places, they're getting five people to do the job of one person. And it, the Joe Biden administration is using this as leverage to say, oh, look how many jobs we created. But a lot of these mm -hmm. jobs are part time. And people. And if you think about it, in the times of my parents and grandparents, Gen X and above, people are allowed when you go job searching, you can get a full time job with benefits without no college degree. Now, every job that's on the market, if you if you're not in college, you can expect to get part time. You know, and there's so many jobs out here that be like, oh, you can get, you, you know, you work every day, but it's only 30 fucking hours. And you then, OK, now you're right below the full time. Th Oh, shit, did they care for y'all? for full-time yeah, work. Oh, They're like, oh, instead of, instead of getting one job for full-time work, let me get four or five jobs that will add up to one full-time job. The fuck is this, bro? Like, you can't even, if you if you, if you don't go to college, if you don't pay $100,000 for a fucking university, I'm sorry, I know this is a recorded space, so I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to cuss so much, but. No, talk your shit. Talk all if, your shit. Keep you going. Putting put this $1,000 down to get, you know, a degree, now you can't get you don't can't have health insurance why the fuck is health insurance all these things 
at like connected to my job what happens when i'm sick with covid and i can't work now i don't have my insurance now i can't pay for regular things you know that are necessary dentistry and all this extra stuff that everything your health insurance housing insurance everything is connected to your job what happens to the people who can't work or the people who, who can't work sufficiently enough or to what they think is deemed sufficient enough now you can't figure shit out and uh, this is not making sense y'all i'm just i just use this opportunity to kind of like vent but <laughs> no it makes perfect sense it literally speaks to point number four you just described all the conditions in which he highlights that when they all exist you are going to hear the rhetoric of you someone who is young who is naming all the things that are real and yet with a fervor like what the fuck is this and According to this book and many other revolutionary texts, they say when the people get to that level of consciousness and awareness, those are the times of revolution. And this is and this is the times we should study and realize what it is and recognize it. So you speaking again, it goes directly to what we just read. So thank you. No, everything you said was on point. Yo, I'll dig back into the text. This is really good. I'm feeling this. I right, so I think I left off. Oh, okay. We shall also see that the high tide of revolution against the imperialists, the warlords, and the landlords is inevitable and will come very soon. All China is littered with dry fat. Oh, we'll not do that. <laughs> dry, which will soon be aflame. And I think he means cigarettes. I'm going to just say, um, someone else can tell me different. The saying, a single spark can start a prairie fire. Yeah, I think that's what he means. And an apt a description of how the current situation will develop. We need only look at the strikes by the workers and the uprisings by the peasants, the mutinies of soldiers and the strikes of students, which are developing to see that it cannot be long before a spark kindles a prairie fire. And that was Mao's conclusion. In his theory of guerrilla warfare, whether against domestic or foreign enemies, Mao distinguishes carefully the various phases of development of the campaign laying particular emphasis on the first phase, which he calls the period of the strategic defensive. In the beginning, and the first phase may last for many months, territory is nothing, attrition is everything. The enemy is permitted, even encouraged to expand where he will. The guerrillas give ground, conducting only harassing action circling around, fighting always in the enemy's rear areas and presenting no continuous front for the foe to smash. The enemy is engaged during this period in a strategic offensive with the, ob with the object of wiping out the guerrillas. On his part, the action is characterized by a series of encirclement and suppression. Campaigns compare the so-called clear and fold efforts in South Vietnam today under American leadership, during which the effort is made to occupy territory and to rid it of guerrilla infestation, piecemeal. The contradiction implicit in this effort is that it converts increasingly large parts of the national territory into government, in quotes, rear areas where guerrilla operations work best. So basically they play into the conditions that actually are, are advantageous for the guerrilla. And, uh, and for us, we would have to recognize these moments too. I'll keep reading. The repressive forces succeed in circling areas of guerrilla activity. No one stops them. But in the process, they themselves become encircled by guerrillas. And while the guerrillas can almost always slip out of any encirclement by dispersion and exfiltration, how can the army slip out? Where is the front? It does not exist. Movements of men and material become progressively greater and more expensive. The lines of supply and communication become ever longer, more attenuated, in and more vulnerable to guerrilla attack. In effect, the army, in occupying broad ex expanses of rural territory, abets the guerrillas by providing them with broader and easier targets and more accessible sources of arms and ammunition. The guerrilla strategy remains constant during this period, although tactics vary with the situation. The strategy is to force the enemy to spread himself as thin as possible by harassing him all along the line, wherever he is weak, and then to concentrate all available guerrilla strength to annihilate, never merely to rout inferior enemy units one at a time was that one page or two pages i think that was two yeah it was two okay ours are guerrilla tactics and writes mao they 
Did that go out or is it just concentrate? Me? I'm sorry. Uh, you were, did I cut out? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. It's all good. Ours are guerrilla tactics, writes Mal. They consist mainly of the following points. Divide our forces to arouse the masses. Concentrate our forces to deal with the enemy. The enemy advances, we retreat. The enemy camps, we harass. The enemy tires, we attack. The enemy retreats, we pursue. To extend stable base areas, employ the policy of advancing in waves. When pursued by a powerful enemy, employ the policy of circling around. Arouse the greatest numbers of the masses in the shortest time by the best possible methods. These, these tactics are just like casting a net. Casting a net. At any moment, we should be able to cast it or draw it in. We cast it wide to win over the masses and draw it in to deal with the enemy. In areas where little opposition is met, the net is cast. The guerrillas disperse to carry on the work of the political indoctrination, to strengthen the internal economy of the revolutionary movement, to establish rear base areas, bases which, it should be noted, can be expanded or contracted or even abandoned on short notice. Where opposition is strong, the net is drawn in. The guerrillas are able to concentrate heavy forces. Mal recommends two or four or even six times the enemy's strength against a single enemy weak point. Battles are not prolonged. On the, contract, on the contrary, it is Mal who has invented the five-minute attack. It consists of a sudden onslaught, a brief and furious interval of fighting, and then the assault is broken off as suddenly as it began, and the guerrillas rapidly retire, having inflicted as many casualties and taken as many arms as possible during the standard time, but not lingering even a minute for even a minute for more. Mao stresses the battle of quick decision, the very opposite of Western military strategy, where the army backed by heavy industry is able to make a long drawn technological contest of each battle relying on superior superiority superiority of equipment and logistics to tell the to tell in the end the guerrillas must rely on speed superior position and lo locally superior manpower and must break off the engagement before the superiority of heavy weapons can take its toll as we have remarked before the guerrilla fights the war of the flea the flea bites hops and bites again nimbly avoiding the foot that would crush him. He does not seek to kill his enemy at a blow, but to bleed him and feed on him, to plague and bedevil him, to keep him from resting and to destroy his nerve and his morale. All of this requires time. Still more time is required to breed more fleas. What starts as a local infestation must become an epidemic as one by one, the areas of resistance link up like spreading ink spots on a blotter. In the second phase of the in the second phase of the campaign, the period of equilibrium, a stalemate sets in. The government finds it cannot destroy the guerrillas. For the moment, it can only seek to contain them while preparing new offenses for the future. The guerrillas cannot destroy the army. They continue to harass it, taking advantage of the lulls in the conflict to expand the revolutionary base areas, nibbling away at the fringe of no man's land that surrounds each liberated zone, improving the internal economy of crops, workshops, arm repair de depots, and using the time to agitate the people to forward the war of propaganda and to sharpen the internal conflicts that shake the enemy camp as the long, expensive, anti-guerrilla campaign bogs down and the end appears hopelessly far away. The third stage, that of the revolutionary strategic offensive or general offensive, begins when the opposing forces of the government and those of the guerrillas have reached a balance and the insurgents siege the military initiative. Now no longer as pure guerrillas, but as mobile columns up to divisional strength, capable of confronting and destroying the army in open battle. 
when the insur- when the insurgents formally gave way at the approach of the enemy or dependent on a hit and run ambushes on a, or dependent on hit and run ambushes they will now give battle using small units to pin down the main forces of the government while their regular troops are thrown always in superior numbers in con- in concentrated attacks on the most vulnerable objectives along the enemy's uh intentuated intentuated lines a t t e n u a t e d y'all <laughs> of support or weakest points of contra- concentration while encircled, the rebels, instead of dispersing and exfiltrating under cover of darkness as before, will concentrate and make a powerful breakthrough at a chosen point in the enemy's lines, again, perhaps using secondary troops to pin down the army in other areas. Gradually, sometimes using guerrilla tactics, uh, other times concentrating for powerful strategic blows, the rebels will succeed in cutting the enemy's main lines of communication and isolating segments of the enemy's forces, which can be destroyed at a time, at one at a time. The insurgents will themselves begin to hold territory, first expanding their rural bases until they have blotted up most of the countryside, making it untenable for the enemy then seizing the villages and the larger towns, driving the army back into its urban strong points, which, once isolated, can be reduced piecemeal. Yeah, thank you for reading it. Go ahead, Four Cups. As the strong points are reduced and the army's manpower is whittled down, with big units captured or annihilated and other de- defecting as may be expected if they are native troops, the rebels will come into possession of heavy weapons, tanks, artillery, which can be used to reduce even larger strong points until at last a siege of the cities, aided by popular uprisings, bring the war to its successful termination in the destruction or surrender of the army and the collapse of the government. A principle can be observed throughout this entire process. The more the enemy holds, the more he has to defend and the broader the insurgent target area. Yet on the other hand, the more the insurgent fight and wins, Um, the more he has with which to fight and to win in arms, in in manpower, in material resources. Thus, the objectives of the government and of the insurgent must be diametrically opposed, diametrically opposed. The army seeks to end the war as quickly as possible in order to minimize its losses. The insurgent seeks to prolong it since he has everything to gain by it. It is clear that the guerrilla objectives cannot be accomplished overnight or even within any predictable period. It is a basic premise of Mao's theory that the phases of the campaign will overlap, that on many occasions setbacks will occur, mobile units may have been to, may have to be dispersed again to become guerrilla bands. The may the third phase may slip back into the second territory that has been won may be surrendered and may change hands many times before it can finally be consolidated as part of the spreading red territory. On a map, the areas of guerrilla activity will appear as tiny ink spots. Gradually, they will become splotches, and the splotches will grow larger until they finally run together into solid red, spreading over the entire national territory. But note, the coloration will progress not from east to west or north to south, but from the outside in, from the mountains and the jungles to the cultivated rural areas, then to the villages within those areas, then to the towns and along the national highways. 
and only in the final struggle to the diminishing pinpricks of the cities. The principles of the operation may be observed in the communist war in on Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist troops. I don't even know if I said the name right, but it is what it is. In the period immediately following the Second World War, analyzing a campaign of 17 months during 17 months duration in 1946 to 47 during which 640,000 nationalist troops were killed or wounded and 1,050,000 were captured Mao lists the following points of insurgent strategy one attack dispersed Isolated enemies for forces first, attack concentrated strong forces later. Two, take small and medium cities and extensive rural areas first, take big cities later. Three, make wiping out the enemy's effective strength our main objective. Do not make holding or seizing a city or place our main objective. Holding or seizing a city or place is the outcome of wiping out the enemy's effective strength, and often a city or place with will be held or seized for good only after it has changed hands a number of times. Four, in every battle, concentrate an absolutely superior force, two, three, four, and sometimes even five or six times the enemy's strength. Encircle the enemy forces completely, strive to wipe them out thoroughly, and do not let any escape from the net. In special circumstances, use the method of dealing the enemy crushing blows, that is, concentrate all out strength to make a frontal attack and an attack on one or both of his flanks with the aim of wiping out one part and routing another so that our enemy can swiftly move its troops to smash other enemy forces. Strive to avoid battles of attrition in which we lose more than we gain or break even. In this way, although inferior as a whole in terms of numbers, we shall be absolutely superior in every part, in every specific campaign, and this ensures victory in the campaign. As time goes on, we shall become superior as a whole and eventually wipe out all of the enemy. Number five, fight no ba battle unprepared. Fight no battle you are not sure of winning. Make every effort to be well prepared for each battle. Make sure make every effort to ensure victory in the given set of conditions as between the enemy and ourselves. Six, give full play to our style of fighting, courage and battle, no fear or of sacrifice, no fear of fatigue and continuous fighting. That is fighting ex successive battles in a short time without rest. Seven, Strive to wipe out the enemy when he is on the move. At the same time, pay attention to the tactics of, pos of positional attack and capture enemy fortified points and cities. Eight, replenish our strengths with all the arms and most of the personnel captured from the enemy. Our army's main sources of manpower and material are at the front. Nine, make good use of intervals between campaigns to rest, train, and consolidate our troops. Periods of rest, training, and consolidation should not be very long, and the enemy should, so far as possible, be permitted no breathing space. Much of what Mao enumerates will seem obvious, but there are important points to note, some of which are in direct conflict with the conventional military doctrine. Although the mobile warfare of insurgency resembles that of conventional forces, it is based on guerrilla strategy and works towards somewhat different objectives. 
the insurgents drive in inward from rural areas towards the towns and the cities. They occupy the hills and the woods before they seize the roads. In this, they have the they behave in a manner diametrically a position diametrically opposite to the dictates of Western military strategy and with strong points, industrial centers, communication centers, population centers are hit first and the mop up of the rural areas is left until last. Yo, thank you for reading that. Um, did you want to say anything? Because the, the part you just read, it got my mind going and, and I want to contribute before I start reading. Was there anything you wanted to add for? I mean, I would, but kind of, I'm like I'm kind of processing what I just read. I have ADHD, so it's kind of hard for me to like. But oh no! I'm understanding. Uh, um, mm-hmm. He kind of just given like a play by play of like what these people do during war and how they. Because, like, if we're thinking about, like, the time and the will or whatever, some of these rules is, like, like making sure that they spend less time um, resting so that the enemy doesn't rest as well. I don't know. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like... No, okay. that's that's... Those are good points. No, those are good points. The reason why I ask is because, like, as you were reading, I was thinking about how there's a lot of white supremacist militias who have already been training up to this point, who've actually done a lot of these points already. So one of the, um, I am, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't remember this cracker's name, but he ran over a protester and killed her. And it was a big thing. And I want to say it was in Carolina. Uh, was it Charlotte, North Carolina? Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah. And there was also around that same time, there was that whole Tiki Torch cracker march they had and shit where they were talking about you will not replace us. And they found out that in both incidents, they had like stashes of weapons, caches of weapons stationed like outside the city perimeters in different areas. And that was a lot part that didn't get highlighted the most because it gives you a total understanding, a different understanding of what you're actually fighting and doing, because when people talk about the white lash or when I bring up the white lash that happened when Obama became uh, president, which he's also an imperialist and a war criminal. So there is no glorification of Obama in this space. But I'm bringing him up because there was a white lash reaction. Well, what ended up happening is they continued on the process that they already had going on, but it amplified because to them that signaled the, the meaning of the end. So what they did is they start training, their, pulling their kids from public schools and homeschooling their kids and then training them to take specific positions. Like they're like, all right, you're going to train because we play golf with so and so so he can get you into politics or they can get you into radio or we, you're going to go here and you're going to go there. And then you're going to be we're going to donate to this politician that's going to cut these breaks. And the reason why they did that is to spread influence and infiltrate offices. So a lot of the um, politicians that you see that you're like, how does Marjorie Taylor Green end up where the fuck she's at? That was a lot of organizing from a lot of the white lash that was happening where they got behind a lot of vocally reactionary people and open fascist people who say, hey, y'all want to take it to this Nazi level? I will do it. And they galvanized that support and galvanized their base. And what I'm trying to say is that as Four Cups is reading the different points in which the guerrilla insurgent must, you know, gain power and how that looks. I was just it just reminded me of a lot of the articles and a lot of the. Radios I've been listening, especially out here on AM radio, they these crackers talk about their shit all the time and how they've been preparing for what they call the civil war and another group calls an Armageddon for years now. And the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of times when we talk about guerrilla warfare, we think, oh, we're just going to be fighting the government. It's just going to be fighting the empire. It's like, yeah, the empire, too, but also, too, a lot of the empire have will already deputize people in these what they would call militias and these hate groups and shit that they've already formed, been training. A lot of them have been training in MMA for years for, for waiting for that moment for when the, everything aligns in which they can also gain power. I bring that up because not all, not all movements are revolutionary. And this book talks about that. So while we're also describing the conditions that like align 
for these things to happen, for insurgency to develop, we would also have to be critical of which insurgency, insurgency serves who. Like, is this insurgency meant for the infighting in the upper classes so that they're, sorry, so that they're, are they being funded by, you know, upper class right wing fascists who want power and they're going to use, you know, these lower level people to go and fight their battles, to go and storm the White House, to go and do this and that? And will it be a mistake on our part to look at those things as alignment with ours when it absolutely is not? I don't know. It's just you had me thinking a lot for it because that's all. It's just you got my mind going. I should have had paper and pen and made a lot of notes because I'm definitely going to revisit this book again. This is only my second time reading it, and I'm glad we are. So I'll, I'll go back into the reading. I'm done ranting. <laughs> um, let's see. What counts for the insurgents is not strong points, but territory that the enemy cannot contest without involving himself in a contradiction. That of ascending his lines and weakening his effective striking force. Hence, the rural areas first, the cities last. The main source of both rebel munitions and, in China, rebel manpower is the opposing army. The Chinese armies were conscripted, badly paid or not paid at all, often ill-nourished and ill-clothed. The troops were themselves peasants. It was to be expected that defections would be common, and this was the case. Mao had no scruples, for that matter, about recruiting bandits. There were of the same class origin and in much the same condition as the national soldiers and those of the warlords, and could be easily indoctrinated to fight in the popular cause. His reasoning, no doubt, was that peasants who had some military training were easier to absorb than peasants who had had none. As to the question of supplies, it is a tenet of guerrilla theory, not only in China, but in all revolutionary wars, that the enemy must be the main source of weapons and ammunition. One advantage is that one always finds the proper calibers of ammunition close at hand. Another, greater advantage is the logistics problems are reduced to a minimum. The enemy supply lines serve both armies and often serve the guerrilla army better than they do that of the adversary. The guerrilla strategy is dynamic. It has positive political objectives and positive military goals. The strategic defensive, as Mao calls it, is an act of defense based on incessant attack. The harassing tactics of the guerrilla, while they bear superficial resemblance to the delaying actions fought by rear guard regular troops, have a different purpose. It is to wear down the enemy and to force him to overextend his lines so that his manpower can be annihilated a unit at a time. Guerrillas can gain the initiative, writes Mao, if they keep in mind the weak points of the enemy. Because of the enemy's insufficient manpower, guerrillas can operate over vast territories. Because the enemy is a foreigner and a barbarian, guerrillas can gain the confidence of millions of their countrymen. The reference was to the Japanese invader in China, and Mao makes it clear at all times that his laws of war were meant to apply specifically to China and the Chinese situation. What he says, nevertheless, has more general application for foreigner and barbarian substitute oppressor and exploiter, and the confidence of which he speaks can be gained in many countries where no question of foreign intrusion arises. On tactics, in guerrilla warfare, select the tactics of seeming to come from the east and attacking from the west, avoid the solid attack, the hollow attack, withdraw, deliver a lightning blow, seek a lightning decision. On politics, without a political goal, guerrilla warfare must fail as it must as it must if its political objectives do not coincide with the aspirations of the people and their sympathy, cooperation, and assistance cannot be gained. The, assist, the essence of guerrilla warfare is thus political in character. On the other hand, in a war of counter-revolutionary nature, there is no place for guerrilla hostilities, because guerrilla warfare basically derives from the masses and it is supported by them. It can neither exist nor flourish if it separates itself from their sympathies and co-optation. Mao's rules for the conduct of guerrilla warfare are rhetorical, are rhetorical, redundant, and often less precise than one might wish. They leave many practical questions unanswered. It is to be remembered that he was writing political documents, not a text for insurgents. His collected works remain, nevertheless, the premiere of guerrilla theory and the study of his campaigns, which ended with the destruction and defeat of an army of 3,700,000 men, the greatest in Chinese history, reveals much that its 
relevant elsewhere in countries which, like China, lack arms and industry, but do not lack the basic ingredients of revolutionary war, space, time, and will. And that's the end of chapter four. And it's been a, it's been an hour. So we'll stop here at chapter five. And um, yeah, we'll start a discussion. So I'm going to grab some water. And if anything, the other two speakers here, I will give out co-host real quick. Okay, so I just handed y'all co-host and yeah, anything that y'all want to add from what you've been able to read or process and again, no pressure, like it's just discussion for any of those who want to continue the conversation or have anything to add. And I'm going to look in the comments because there might be questions there. Oh, real quick. I want to remind people that in the comment section, you'll see mutual aid posts to support and help boost them in any way that you can support, do so. And one of the uh, best ways to support is, of course, is to retweet and share them so more people can see that so that those who do who are in a position can help can be able to see the post so that they can help. So those are in the comment section. And so far, I don't see any questions. So. Host or co-host or any co-host, you have anything to add? If not, yo, we can end the space here and it's it's all good. I don't have nothing to add. I just want to thank you again, Penn, for uh, facilitating the space and also to Four Cups for being a co-host and reading along with us. Thank you. Thank you, Beck. Thank you, Penn, for reading as well. Thank you for this space, y'all. Um, this, um, I got to process what I've been reading, but a thought that I'm having here is that, like, because to, to, like, I don't know, this has been said before, but, like, if we are going to win, we have to move differently than our oppressor. And one thing that I'm noticing when it comes to, like, war is how our oppressor treats its soldiers. They don't treat its soldiers like people that are fighting. They treat their soldiers as like tools or something that's easily thrown away. They're not giving a fuck about their life or like the fact that people are losing their lives to fight for them or to fight for their cause. And I just don't think that, well, it's not that I don't think that. It's, it's, it's like we definitely should not be, like, not um, giving a fuck about our lives and, and making sure that we honor the people that lose their lives um, while we fight for freedom. No, that is a good point. And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, how we were reading um, about the Haitian Revolution, uh, the Black Jacobins written by C.L.R. James. And he described some of the soldiers that were of the initial revolutionaries who were burning the plantations down, who were hunting down in practice and getting their freedom. That when they joined the army, Toussaint's army, how a lot of them still remained in rags, hungry, while the, the generals and those in higher positions were getting, you know, fat and, and living in mansions. And the discrepancy, the hierarchy of how, like you, what you just described and what we read in this book as well, like talk, described the soldiers in basically the same way. And that if we are to form or to engage in the revolutionary process, like I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying we can't mirror that. There's no way in which we should be forming circles and communities uh, for liberation that people are oppressed, people are violently preyed upon, and that it's allowed and that it's encouraged and normalized. That, you know, anytime we, we get amongst each other, we have to worry about who's going to be reactionary because we allow safety for reactionaries within our community. And you're saying that these are one of the ways, like, again, we cannot mirror the oppressor because we cannot build sustainable resistance under those conditions. 
So when you say that, it makes me think about, again, at looking around and analyzing where I'm at and where we all at as a people. And if we keep saying we want to get free, well, then the first thing we'd have to do is kill the oppressor in our head and to also kill the people who are spying oppressors within our community. And in there, we'll be able to have the time, the space, and the will to want to fight because now we have a community worth fighting for. So I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Go ahead, Beck. What's up? And I I was thinking of this point earlier, but I didn't want to speak on it because, you know, I wanted to come with like original thoughts. But, you know, I'll say it anyway, just to add to the conversation of the last couple points that you read, or I think maybe Four Cups read, was on um, one of the points that said, and I quote, um, make good use of intervals between campaigns to rest train and consolidate our troops. Periods of rest training and consolidation should not be very long, and the enemy should be so far as possible to be permitted no breathing space. So, you know, I think that when we're like doing organizing and uh, all these like mutual aid efforts and stuff like that, I feel like sometimes, especially for people of color, trans women, people who are like on the like margins tend to be the ones who are you know worn out and we we feel like we have to always keep fighting keep fighting keep fighting because who's going to fight for us at the end of the day right but even these guys who are guerrilla fighters said rest is important you know be vigilant you know don't take too long because you know you you always want to make sure the enemy's not behind you but it's important to regroup you know and that's something that uh the enemy doesn't naturally do because when they have like numbers on their side a lot of the time so they don't have to let the person rest they can just discard of them like y'all said and bring in new troops but we don't have that luxury so rest is very important um especially in this new year you know uh the campaign the presidential campaigns are going to start rolling and it's going to be really heated politically even right now i think um now I know that the um, Israel is de defending themselves in the ICC court right now, and I don't, you know, I'm not really, I, <laughs> I don't want to say that it's not important, you know, because you know people, you know, it's good that South Africa is taking them to court anyway. But what I'm trying to say is that a lot of things politically is going on, and that is going to feel like we're going to have to fight at all fronts but it's important to make sure you and your community is good um because if you're if you're too tired to fight then you won't be able to you know what i'm saying if resting is not just about you know being tired it's about regaining your willpower for the next day no that's a really good point because all the stuff you said 100 percent and it got me thinking too, and the way in which we're constantly kept busy. And you know, that indoctrination of hustle and grind culture, that that new wrapped in black capitalism bullshit that, you know, you're not really an adult unless your your schedule is fully stacked and you're constantly busy. And then all of that is to me, how can one organize in that? Also, too, it leads to guilt. When you were talking, I was thinking about guilt a lot. And how people I talk to, right? Especially those who are like if are unemployed or, you know, or just unable to work because of be, um, we're living in like a mass disabling event of a pandemic in which people are now experiencing a totally different lifestyle than they had four years, five years prior, right? So living in that, people have this guilt that they should be doing something and that they should be constantly moving. And one thing I've, I've been thinking about more is like, well, actually, this should be a time where we should take advantage and really rest. Like, and not feel guilty for sleeping more than once a day because living under white supremacy is exhausting. This is a draining system that has had us grinding from sun up to sundown, which is why a lot of people, when we talk, we compare it to slavery. It's just a very refined version. And where, you know, you have certain luxuries and concessions that fool you into thinking that that's a sign of progress. When in reality, you're still being drained by that same system and kept on this hamster wheel that goes to nowhere, tired and drained. And then at the end of the day, you go home and unable to even relate to your partner, to your kids, or e even recognize yourself in a mirror because you're so tired. And then how in the hell in those conditions can we 
like actually work for liberation or build and strategize for it when you're drained. And I think in these moments where we find ourselves at in a privilege, so to speak, as if you have shelter, that is now a privilege because of the highest rate of, of houselessness and it keeps getting higher. But if we're in a position where we can rest, we absolutely should. And we shouldn't feel guilty about that. And we shouldn't feel like we're falling behind or, you know, the pressure with age and saying, oh, shit, I don't have A, B, C, and D. That capitalist has taught us that we should have by this age. I'm failing. No, you're not. The system is not meant for you to succeed because it's not based in life. It is a death cult. So if you're succeeding in a death cult, you're not succeeding at life. So what you just brought up back got me thinking about, yeah, we can read these uh, scriptures about like, or this work about guerrilla fighting and guerrilla warfare, but to also to, to make the parallels in our, in our immediate life as well, outside of that fighting, what does that look like? And that is us to grapple with our definition of work and how it tethered us to this capitalist system that makes it impossible for us to work towards our revolution. And after that, we look at it a very different way, and especially in this times, right? Those in Imperial Corps that find ourselves very drained and wanting to sleep a lot, that if you can, take that rest. No, I'm babbling now, but yo, you just got, you really had me thinking, and I really appreciate you because now I'm, I want to think more you know, after this space about rest and work and, and write about it and really challenge it and put it that, including that into our strategy to get free. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to add anything else, you can request a mic, but again, it's no pressure. If you have any questions that you'd rather just leave in the comment section, do that. Or if you just rather hit up the DMs of the speaker and have us talk about it either this time or next, you can do that too. And if not, we can always end the space here, but real quick, in the comment sections, there are mutual aid posts. Share them and support them in any way that you can. And then also, too, in the Jumbotron, there's a PDF of what we're reading. And then there's also the previous space, part two. So I'll let y'all know when part three is. If you set your notifications on, though, it'll give you an, an alert. Because sometimes I can't send out the spaces to everyone that I would like to. But I want everyone to get a chance to know when the spaces are so that they want to come, they can. So if you set the notifications, that will help as well. And of course, sharing the space helps. So with that, I just want to encourage y'all to, ooh, we have a big freeze coming and I hope everyone has what they need. I know in most likelihood we don't. So remember to check on the people in the affected areas as best we can and keep track of each other. And then if you need anything, you know, create a mutual aid post or hit one of us up at the DMs and we'll try to help each other do this as best as possible because especially if you're in Texas, the grid ain't shit. And they don't they don't hesitate to cut off to do rolling blackouts in certain areas, mostly the poorest and blackest areas, so that the wealthier white areas can keep their water lights on in their fountain in their front yard. That type of bullshit. And every in the last time we had a big freeze, people died. Babies and elderly people died. Because if you don't have electricity, you don't have heat. And yeah, so Check on people across the country. I think even the all of New York, I saw it. There is a map, actually, of, of the affected areas. And it's a large part of the country. So take a look at that map if y'all can find it. And, yeah, keep an eye on those areas and the people in those areas affected. And remember to check on each other. So with that, I'm going to remind y'all to look out for each other and to take care of each other. And, of course, let's get free.